Well, I, it's my pleasure. First of all, I want to thank um, Mark and Elena because this lecture series would not go without the kind of smile and great AV support and moral um, uh, innervating that we get from having uh, superb people help us with this. But it's my great pleasure to introduce our um, today's speaker, Dr. Shelley McKellar. Shelley is the professor and Hannah and Jason Hanna chair in the history of medicine at Western University in Canada. Her talk will be entitled Last Resort Sentiments and Implications, Cutting Instruments and Technology in the History of Surgery. Um, Shelley McKellar is the Hanna chair in the history of medicine in the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry. She's professor of history in the Faculty of Social Sciences, and she also has joint appointment in the, as a professor in the Department of Surgery. Her scholarship focuses on the history of surgery, the history of medical technology, with a special interest in the history of instruments, devices, heart disease, and medical biography. Shelley is the author of several books, including The Artificial Heart, The Allure and Ambivalence of a Controversial Medical Technology, Medicine and Technology in Canada, 1900 to 1950, the Surgical Limits, The Life of Gordon Murray, as well as co-editor of Essays in Honor of Michael Bliss, um, Figuring the Social with Elizabeth Eman and Allison Lee. She has published numerous articles in various journals, such as the New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, Technology and Culture, and the Canadian Bulletin, The History of Medicine. Shelley is a dynamic speaker and a highly sought out faculty she is an invited member of the expert advisory panel for medical sensations exhibit at the recently opened Canada Science and Technology Museum in Ottawa. An invited um, member of the History and Heritage Advisory Committee to the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. An invited contributor to boot camp curriculum, for the American College of Surgeons, an elected council member of the American Association for the History of Medicine. She has served on numerous uh, research, grant review committees, book prizes, academic meeting committees, and manuscript reviewers for academic medicine and journals. In 2019, Shelley was named Western University Faculty Scholar. Her work as a medical historian proved instrumental to the board um, as she was elected to the um, Associated Medical Services Board, which is a funder of medical history in Canada and a charitable organization that serves as a, a catalyst for change for healthcare in Canada. In addition, she's a um, dynamic scholar. She's a great lecturer and she's a terrific colleague, both um, on this side and the other side of the, the great um, US Canadian border. And it's my pleasure to have Shelley come and talk to us and I'm sure it's interesting, Shelley. We, um, the University of Chicago, was recently named as um, one of the top heart transplant programs in the nation, which is kind of interesting. So it'll be interesting to have this segue, as this is actually part and parcel of our, you know, active clinical practice here. So thank you. Further ado, without further ado. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Mindy, for that very, very kind introduction and this invitation to participate in this series. Mindy knows that I'm all about talking outside your silo. And I think different groups of people should talk to each other. So medical historians should be talking to active medical practitioners, should be talking to bioethicists, should be talking to the media. And I think that all of us can have a really interesting conversation as we've talked a lot about issues that we share concerns and questions and come at some kind of consensus or discussion of what we think are priorities moving forward. So I was, I was delighted to receive this invitation to participate in this series because I thought this audience would help me frame some of my questions and maybe a little differently than I had a thought about approaching my new book project. So my talk today is a new talk, which I've never given before, but it's a new talk that combines some of my past research work with some new research interests and questions of mine. I'm interested in the history of surgery and I'm interested in decision-making. And in particular, I'm interested in this big question. When to cut and when not to cut? When is surgical intervention the appropriate course of action? And when is it not? I mean, who decides when to cut and when not to cut? 
And does the answer differ if you are the surgeon or if you are the patient or another stakeholder? Now, obviously, to cut or not to cut is a big question. So I connect it with another one of my research interests, that being medical technology, devices, and instruments. So how does the equipment play into this decision-making of to cut or not to cut? And during my past, uh, my past book projects, when I wrote about the life of surgeon Gordon Murray, and certainly when I wrote about the history of the artificial heart, this big question, when and if to cut or not to cut was ever present. There was lots of discussions, always lots of talk about when to cut into the body, which organs to cut into, whether you're going to remove the organs, repair or rebuild damaged organs or do something else. And I would always run across this sentiment or ethos that cutting or intervening surgically was to be a last resort. Surgery was a last resort. So then I started adding that last resort bit to my research questions. How do the devices and instruments play into last resort sentiments and implications in the history of surgery? And that's how I landed on this more focused line of inquiry that would bring together a lot of my research interests. And that focused research question of mine is, to what degree do surgical instruments and devices reinforce or disrupt the idea of surgery as a last resort treatment or medical course. So I'll attempt to address that today and I'd like to garner your thoughts on this. And I've divided my talk for today into four parts. So first I'll address the term or saying of last resort and what that infers. And then we'll situate last resort sentiments and implications within surgical decision-making. And we'll drill down on that by exploring the use of artificial hearts as, uh, as in my case study number one and the use of tonsil tones or tonsil guillotines as my case number two. So note, I've chosen two very different organs, hearts and tonsils to discuss uh, cutting or removing or replacing. And I've selected two very different time periods when it comes to doing surgery, the 20th century and the 19th century and we'll see what connections we can make. I suggest thinking about three aspects of these case studies, and those three aspects being expectations, limitations, and uncertainty in the realm of surgery. And that's what I'd like folks to consider as a, a possible takeaway from my talk. Consider expectations, limitations, and uncertainty. Okay, I'm interested in cutting. That is the act and the decision to cut into the body within the context of health and medicine. So who decides when and where to cut into the body? Who does the cutting? Why are surgeons cutting? And what do they use to cut into the body? Yes, what do surgeons use to cut in the body? I'm interested in surgical instruments. In particular, the instruments that cut, incise, or dissect, such as uh, scalpels, saws, Trefines, scarificators, scissors, and more. So these are the sharps or sharp instruments. So what can these instruments tell us about cutting? Certainly it's not all about the instruments, but I would argue they do play a key role. What is the intention, the mechanism, and the action of the instrument? Is that important? Certainly there exist bigger questions that revolve around how and why we trust and do cutting in medicine. And certainly that is complicated. In many cases, the decision to cut is shaped by the instruments and the intentions surrounding a sort of specific procedure. Certainly it's situated against the skill of the surgeon and certainly the state of surgical knowledge at a particular time and place. And today I'm going to focus more narrowly on cutting as a last resort and the role played by instruments in that framing or construction of some surgical interventions as being a last resort measure. So what do we mean by last resort? Let's try to unpack that term a bit. What's a last resort sentiment and what does that imply? So when I say this is a measure of last resort, most people would think this is a final course of action or the final resource to try to solve a problem after we've tried all other attempts. And these attempts have been unsuccessful. So something you do when everything else has failed. 
What does last resort mean in medicine? So a drug of last resort is a pharmaceutical drug, which has been tried after all other drug options have failed to provide what we see or would like as the adequate response in the patient. And this may be outside of extent regulatory requirements or medical best practices. So a last resort option, I think, can be viewed as a final option, usually when the preferable ones have failed and to thing you decide to do when everything else has failed. So a sense of hope, perhaps. On the other side of the specter, however, a last resort option may be viewed as a misguided therapeutic innovation. So this is a, a desperate, dreaded kind of Hail Mary attempt to address a medical dilemma. So primarily because there's no other option. So on this slide, you see I've got on one side, you've got hope, maybe enthusiasm. On the other side, maybe there's dread, maybe aversion. So why is surgery relegated into a last resort category? So surgery as a last resort because unlike most other forms of medical treatment, this is about inflicting trauma upon the body. So this may rise eyebrows when you are considering, are the benefits of this trauma outweighing the potential harm, benefits and harm? So if you think about surgery in the 19th century, this surgery is still problematic. In the 19th century, surgeons needed to get control of three things to increase their operation success rates. They needed to get control of pain, they needed to control bleeding, they needed to control inflection, infection. So pain, bleeding, infection. And over time, they did gain con better control over those three things. You might also might ask about this idea of choice. Kind of, what about a sense of choice? And the bioethicists will certainly weigh in here. Is there really a choice? Is it framed as a last resort when a patient has run out of alternatives? So you see on the slide I'm showing you these 21st century images. And you see that this is last resort operations, such as spine surgery, back pain management, joint replacement surgery, bariatric surgery. And you get the sense of last resort is very much intertwined with the sense that the rate of failure is high for these surgical procedures. So the last resort surgeries weighing risk benefit, and it might only sort of work or when you've run out of other options. Now the medical historians in the audience will immediately think of Jack Pressman's book and his use of the term last resort, which he uses in his book title, Last Resort, Psychosurgery and the Limits of Medicine. Pressman explores the history of lobotomy as a surgical procedure and he examines clinical decision-making and he teases out different actor groups that are involved, the psychiatrists, the surgeons, the asylum managers, the patients and others to get their perspectives. And Pressman gets at the various cultural attitudes to lobotomy, lobotomy, which was dubbed ice pick surgery at the time. And he wants to understand how this procedure became popular. I mean, lobotomy was once highly valued and thought by many to be efficacious. And then it shifted quite dramatically to be viewed in about a decade's time to be seen as this useless surgery, this bar barbaric surgery. So there's a last resort meaning that was attached to surgery. And this is a loaded phrase, loaded meaning. And in the case of lobotomy, as Pressman kind of teases out, it's loaded with fear yet hope. Lobotomy procedure for the patient suffering, uh, going under the knife for this procedure, there's both fear and hope. And for the most part, surgery fails most people with dread even though it might be in their best interest. So people are nervous about surgery. So in spite of excellent outcomes and low complications, the general public tends to be apprehensive regarding most surgery. And this tends to lead them to choose alternative methods of treatment. And I think this is totally understandable because cutting is visceral. So it should be avoided, right? I mean, cutting gets a better rap when it's deemed to be necessary and when it works. And this puts the definition of success versus failure into the discussion. But in medicine, cutting is physical and symbolic. Surgeons cut into consenting patients to remove and repair damaged body parts. Cutting is a skilled manual action that infers a fix or cure. 
typically by a scalpel. Cutting also embodies precision and power. It assumes familiarity and wise judgment of the surgeon. And it might also generate new knowledge about disease and the body. So for the patient undergoing surgery or going under the knife, does it come down to technicality and trust to be able to achieve a successful outcome? To what extent does certain death so if you do nothing, if you take no action, do not take this last resort option of cutting, you will most certainly die. To what extent does certain death sway the decision to cut? So I presented you with a lot of questions and I thought maybe this context would help you to uh, kind of consider um, some of the broader questions when we get down to parts and tonsils. And that's the case studies that I want to present to you today to see if any answers or themes emerge. So let's get into my first case study of hearts. Let's talk about heart failure. So we all know that heart disease is a serious problem in North America. Heart failure is one type of heart disease. Heart failure is a chronic progressive condition in which the heart muscle is unable to pump enough blood to meet the body's needs for blood and oxygen. And this results in fatigue, shortness of breath, and everyday activities such as walking, climbing stairs, or carrying groceries becomes difficult for that person experiencing heart failure. So heart failure is a serious condition and there's no cure. But wait, could an artificial heart be built? one that would work well enough to replace a diseased tumor heart unless you're eliminating the heart failure problem. Could we? Should we explore such a possibility? Researchers and clinicians seriously asked these questions back in the 1950s and 1960s. Now at the time, cardiac replacement as a whole was being debated and it was not yet evident which was the better replacement course. Replace it with a biological heart, or replace it with a mechanical heart, or if either of these options was really a viable option. This whole idea of really could you tinker around with the heart and replace it? Remember at the time, 1950s, 1960s, transplantation of the heart, there's lots of issues of rejection and organ supply issues. Whereas mechanical circulatory support systems, they had their own set of conundrums and problems. They had technical function issues. They had biocompatible uh, concerns. Would an artificial heart work? The key point, however, that I'm making here is that in the 1950s and 1960s, whether you thought that you should be going for a biological heart replacement or a mechanical heart replacement, the possibility of cardiac replacement and the specific possibility of artificial hearts was legitimate and their clinical need was compelling. The possibility was legitimate because the new heart lung machine was ushering in this era of open heart surgery in the 1950s. The heart lung machine demonstrated the feasibility of mechanical circulatory support. So if we could do that for the surgeon operating on the heart for a limited time in the operating room, why not build a mechanical heart device for use beyond the operating table? The clinical need for artificial hearts was compelling. The rising incidence of heart failure was worrisome and physicians had limited treatment tools. At mid-century, the standard treatment for heart failure was rest, digitalis, and diuretic drugs. There was no cure. Medical teams wanted more, society wanted more. Heart disease and the specific problems of heart failure gained widespread attention. There was more research and development attention to prevention, diagnosis, and treatment options to address the problem of heart disease. Could an artificial heart be built? Would it work? Could such a device really replace a diseased human heart? Various research teams worked on the development of artificial hearts for decades, and its development was contentious. Was it hubris? Teams worked on artificial hearts around the world, although the R&D was predominantly an American enterprise, and it would be a tremendous biotechnological feat. We're talking about a device that would be life-saving. We're talking about a device that would alter the usual course of events, that when a person's heart failed, that person died. And there were research teams and many others who thought it was indeed possible. Building an artificial heart was possible, and it would save lives. But 
The realization of this technology was never certain. At various times, this technology was on the verge of being buried and abandoned for technological, political, economic, and bioethical issues. Its development was indeed contentious. Now, the slide I'm showing you now is a very busy slide. Heart specialists in the room will be familiar with this slide. This is a heart failure graphic that shows the stages and possible treatment options if you're presented with a patient with heart failure. The point of this slide is to show you that artificial hearts are in today's medical toolbox for treating heart failure. Yay, terrific, right? But look, look where artificial hearts are. They're positioned as very much a last resort measure. Wouldn't you say? It's right here, down in the far right bottom corner. You can see by my red circle here. So at this point, the patient is an end stage, stage D heart failure, and cardiac drugs are not working. So all of these options below are no longer working for this patient. Now, certainly heart transplantation remains the gold standard treatment for end stage heart failure today. But for many transplant ineligible patients, artificial heart devices are now a real option. So medically, artificial hearts framed as a last resort and the decision making to implant or not certainly seems to be in the hands of cardiologists and cardiac surgeons. So here's the question you're probably asking yourself. Can an artificial heart really replace a diseased human heart? Come on. Technically, Yes, and this slide shows several artificial heart devices that are being used clinically today. Perhaps in Chicago, if you have the heart, heart transplant program, you're probably using some of these, these devices either as a bridge to transplant uh, or possibly as destination therapy for transplant ineligible, ineligible patients. So on the slide, you see some of the devices that are in play today. It shows that yes, technically the technology works, but it's not perfect, but maybe that's okay. Perhaps a good enough technology is acceptable when it comes to sustaining someone dying of heart failure. Does a good enough technology enable this treatment to shake off being a last resort treatment? Some patients may think so, especially when patient cases of individuals who are living with these devices start to make the news. There's a media narrative, if you will, of success and improved quality of life, certainly putting off certain death for some of the patients that have gone this route. Consider these past artificial heart patient cases and consider the range of patient experiences and device intentions. So how we got here, or at least how patients might perceive this technology as good enough and even improving. And again, keep in mind those three characteristics or aspects of expectations, limitations, and uncertainty that may shape ideas about something being a last resort measure. So I'm going to show you some cases, some artificial heart cases from the last 20 or 30 years. Now, many of you in the audience may recognize some of the names of these patients. Barney Clark lived 112 days with his artificial heart, but he never left hospital. That was in 1982-83, but that's pretty impressive given that Haskell Carp was the first patient ever implanted with a total artificial heart, but he was sustained for only 64 hours with his artificial heart, and that was back in 1969. Here is a Canadian case. This is Noella Leclerc. She was implanted with an artificial heart in 1986 at the Ottawa Heart Institute. It kept her alive for seven days until her heart transplant surgery. William Schrader lived a remarkable 620 days with his artificial heart. That was in 1984-85. And he held the record for being the longest living patient with a permanent artificial heart until quite recently. And one person who broke that record was this guy, Turkish patient, Nuella Balik. He's a former professional soccer player, and he was implanted with his artificial heart in 2012, and he lived for five years plus with his technology. Robert Tools, probably a name that everyone recognizes. Robert Tools lived 100 and, 
51 days with his artificial heart in 2001. So in 2001, he was implanted with the aviopore heart. And uh, the media ops, lots of pictures made the newspapers about him taking day trips out of the hospital, including going for lunch to White Castle to eat a hamburger. And during that clinical trial, the aviopore heart, James Quinn was one of the patients who received that device. And I wanted to include his case here because at the time in 2001, when he was implanted with the aviopore heart, he was one of the youngest implant patients at the age of 51. And he regretted his decision to be implanted with the device. His recovery was plagued with complications. He said that if he had to do it again, he wouldn't do it. He suffered a fatal stroke caused by the device after living 10 months with his artificial heart. Kathleen Shores was dying of heart failure in a hospital ICU in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. An artificial heart saved her life in November of 2012. A year later, she underwent a successful heart transplant. Troy Golden in Oklahoma City would also have died if not for the availability of an artificial heart. The device kept him alive for 15 months. He returned home, even resumed preaching at his church. He was implanted in 2010 and he died in 2011. Now, we don't know how many patients turned down this implant option, but all of these folks on this slide were implanted with total artificial hearts. And there were different outcomes as a result of their implant decision. Nevertheless, for all of these patients, their diseased, failing native hearts were removed from their bodies and a mechanical heart, a total artificial heart, took its place. And according to Troy Golden surgeon, Dr. James Long, Dr. James Long said it was, quote, almost like performing a resurrection, taking someone who was checking out and giving them life, end quote. And I love that quote, and I've talked to Dr. Long about this, and it, I think very strongly about this resurrectionist capacity of artificial hearts and how that became so appealing to dying patients, their families, society, and the media. And it's true. Artificial hearts provided extra months to patients to spend more time with family or for the lucky ones to receive a donor heart. Extra months after having exhausted all other options, which led them to this last resort measure of being implanted with an artificial heart. Artificial hearts are seductive devices. We are seduced by the promissory nature of artificial hearts as a curative fix for heart failure. This fits neatly within our society's view of the body as this entity of replaceable parts. We have artificial hips and artificial knees, artificial kidneys and more. Artificial hearts are life-sustaining, but they're also imperfect devices with a controversial history. These devices are not always life-sustaining. Sometimes they make patients worse off, but these devices hold the possibility that they just might be the right course to save and improve your health. If I had more time, I would tell you about the 1969 implant case of Haskell Karp, which was reported by the media as a sensational drama in several ways, this triumph story, but also a rescue-oriented last resort surgery that failed. If I had more time, I would tell you about the 1982-83 implant case of Barney Clark. And his is an important case because he actually woke up after his operation. And by waking up after his operation, he could tell us what it was like to live with an artificial heart pounding, working in your chest. But oh yeah, when he woke up from the implant surgery, he was tethered to a large 218 pound drive unit to operate the device that was now implanted in his chest. This 218 pound drive unit, which was dubbed Big Blue. And Clark never left hospital. And this unnerved a lot of people. If I had more time, I'd tell you about the 2010 implant case of Dick Cheney, who credited the HeartMate 2 LVAD device for saving his life. In 2012, Cheney underwent a successful heart transplant after living 20 months with his artificial heart device. In my book, I argue that artificial hearts are seductive devices, indeed a life-sustaining technology, but with a controversial history. I argue that desirability, more than the feasibility or practicality of artificial hearts, drove the invention of the device. 
I argue that the allure and ambivalence of artificial hearts is what anchors this story of how and why this imperfect technology continued to be developed. I argue that artificial hearts were and are situated as a technological solution to the problem of heart failure and that an interpretive flexibility of success was key to its momentum and legitimacy. Given our focus today on last resort sentiments and implications, the artificial heart I think fits easily into a high risk venture that would make anyone pause. Our artificial hearts are cutting into the heart. Is it a last resort or is it a real lifeline? Anyone with heart failure is probably keen on trying other medical options to manage their condition before signing up for a mechanical heart, right? But there are some medical folks who challenge this last resort position. They argue that device implants should take place earlier in a patient's treatment course, before the patients are too sick, before their bodies and quality of life have decompensated too irreparably, before too severe functional deterioration has happened. But then who decides on this timing of when to cut or not to cut, when to implant a device or not? I'm sure folks of the heart transplant program in Chicago there will have some thoughts on that. My point here is that there is this contrasting narrative that mechanical hearts can be a real lifeline for some people, as well as a narrative of being a last resort measure. So let's switch gears a bit. What about a tonsil? Quite a different organ than your heart in terms of organ status or value assigned to it, perhaps. But let's talk about cutting out tonsils. An inflamed, infected tonsil. Now, talking to a medical audience, we all know where our tonsils are located, located in the back of our throat. Please note, not an easy access point for surgeries to get in there and to remove. So what is the best treatment to resolve inflamed tonsils? Surgical removal was one option. Do folks pause when someone suggested removing this organ? Probably not in the same way as a discussion about removing one's heart, but there was debate about when and how to remove inflamed tonsils. And I'm gonna talk about one tonsil removing instrument in the context of this decision-making of when to cut and when not to cut. And let me suggest that the instruments used in tonsil removal played a role in that cutting debate. On the one hand, the tonsil removing instruments disrupted perceptions that tonsil surgery was risky and ineffective, while at the same time, or on the other hand, tonsil removing instruments also reinforced risk perception and last resort sentiment. So what instrument am I talking about? I'm talking about the tonsil guillotine instrument. And here are images of several types of tonsil guillotine instruments or tonsil tones. So what is the intention of this instrument? Well, it was devised to remove inflamed tonsils. Your tonsils are oval shaped soft tissue masses as part of your lymphatic system. So we have two tonsils located at the rear of our throat, one on each side of our throat, not so easy access location. How does the tonsil guillotine work? Well, as the nation implies, the cutting mechanism and operating action is a guillotine. And I actually have one here in my office. So here we go. I've got this instrument in my hand, if you can see me playing with it. And when I talk about a guillotine action for this device, most people, when we talk about the mechanism and the operating action, guillotine, guillotine, people think French Revolution and beheading, which was when the guillotine machine was used in executing people. So this, imagine in your uh, mind that this is a device that has a heavy, sharp blade that slides down vertical guides and it removes one's head from your body. And by extension, this guillotine refers to this action of cutting or shearing off with a blade with some force. It's supposed to be quick and clean, right? And the tonsil guillotine instrument, if you see here, has a wide enough base in which to encircle the tonsil and then a retractable blade that comes through to shear off the inflamed tonsil. So who designed this instrument? Dr. Philip 
Singh Physics did back in the early 19th century. So Dr. Physics was the infamous Philadelphia physician and surgeon. He's been called the father of American surgery, and he is given credit for devising the tonsil guillotine, the instrument that I've been playing with, back in 1828. Now, let me share with you a tonsil excision case of Dr. Physics with you. And I want you, as I'm explaining this case and what's um, presented in front of Dr. Physics, consider was it a last resort measure when Dr. Physics decided to cut out the inflamed tonsils in one of his patients? And consider again those three aspects of expectations, limitations, and uncertainty as I tell you about this surgical case. And remember, this is an instrument from the 19th century. So we're in July of 1830, and it's a Tuesday morning, and Dr. Physics is examining his newest patient. And he's considering how he might use his newest instrument, his tonsil guillotine. His patient was four-year-old Martha Jefferson Trist. She's known as Patty. And she had come with her father, Nicholas Trist, from their home in Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia for the express purpose of having the famous, the well-known, well the esteemed Dr. Physics assess Patty's sore throat and her difficulty with swallowing. The suspicion was Patty had inflamed tonsils. The expectation was that the tonsils would be removed. Dr. Physics and Nicholas Trist agreed on this course of action and there was consent to perform the surgery. But there was a problem. The problem was that Dr. Physics' instrument was too large for Patty's small throat. As he was treating Patty, Dr. Physics tried to insert his tonsil tone several times into Patty's throat, but had difficulty positioning the instrument correctly. Several times he inserted, then removed, then reinserted the tonsil tone in Patty's throat. So he's attempting to fix the instrument around her inflamed tonsil, but he couldn't seem to get it. He only succeeded in frightening the four-year-old girl, which then prompted him to make the decision, I'm going to postpone proceeding further until the next day. And Dr. Physics later admitted to Mr. Trist that Patty's operation would be, quote, the most delicate operation of the sort he had ever had to perform, given her mouth and throat being the smallest he had ever had to examine, end quote. So to him, the answer was obvious. He needed a smaller tonsil tone. He did not even consider using traditional methods, which was using a knife or scissors for the operation. Dr. Physics was clearly invested in his guillotine instrument. So off Dr. Physics went that very same morning, Tuesday morning in July of 1830, he goes off to his instrument makers to inquire about the construction of a smaller tonsil tone. The instrument maker said, yes, yes, no problem. A smaller version of the instrument could be made and it wouldn't take long. It would be ready by 10 a.m. the next day, the next day being Wednesday. This is what the instrument maker promised. Who was the instrument maker? It was Henry Shively. Shively was a cutler who repaired knives and other cutting instruments. And he was a well-known surgical instrument maker in Philadelphia during the first half of the 1800s. Shively is perhaps most famous as the maker of the Bowie knife. For Dr. Physics, Patty's operation and the making of that smaller tonsil tone, quote, occupied his mind all day. He made several trips to his instrument maker's shop on that Tuesday. He's checking in, he's supervising the making of the smaller tonsil tone. Wednesday morning arrived. Dr. Physics presents himself to his instrument maker to pick up his new instrument, but the smaller instrument's not ready yet. So on that Wednesday, Dr. Physics keeps checking in all day long. Is it ready yet? Can I pick it up? Can I move on with it? But it's not ready until 4 p.m. that day. And at 4 p.m., uh, Shively hands over the smaller tonsil tome to Dr. Physics. Now, I'm making a lot of big deal about the timing here. The timing is important. Dr. Physics' plan was to pick up the instrument, then carry on to the upscale boarding house where Mr. Trist and his daughter were staying and where the operation would take place. 
The timing is important because pain management measures were being discussed for this patient to mitigate her pain during the tonsil operation. But wait, the year is 1830. It's pre-anesthesia. The first surgical procedure using anesthesia was still years away. That's not gonna happen until 1846. So what was the pain management plan in 1830? Dr. Physics hoped to give Patty laudanum to dull her operation pain. He gave directions to Mr. Trist to give Patty four drops of laudanum an hour and a half before the operation. The amount and the timing of this is notable. So would four drops of laudanum be dangerous for a four-year-old? Three or four drops, even less of laudanum, was sufficient enough to kill a baby. An adult medicinal dose might have been up to 30 drops, perhaps as high as 50 to 60 drops a day. The amount of laudanum planned for Patty is probably acceptable. The timing is trickier. The exact timing of Patty's operation was yet to be fixed since it depended on when Dr. Physics actually possessed that new smaller instrument. And in the end, Patty did not receive any laudanum. In the end, the pre-operation window during which time Mr. Triss would have administered the laudanum wasn't known in time due to the instrument maker's delay in finishing the instrument. So late on Wednesday afternoon, Dr. Physics picked up the new smaller instrument and then carried on to the lodgings where Mr. Triss and his daughter were staying. Dr. Physics arrived at 5 p.m. with his new instruments and he's ready to excise Patty's inflamed tonsil. Well, you can imagine what's gonna happen. Upon seeing the doctor and the cutting instrument, Patty burst into tears. Patty cried and cried. She's so nervous and upset. She couldn't be consoled or reasoned with. And remember, no pain management strategy in place here. Since she's so upset, this meant that her father had to forcibly hold her down during the operation, while Dr. Physics forcibly opened her mouth to insert the instrument into Patty's throat to do the deed of cutting that inflamed tonsil. And this instrument, the tonsil guillotine, promised to remove the offending tonsil in one cut, a quick, painless cut. Was this the case for Patty? Well, I'm happy to report that the procedure went well, according to her father and Dr. Physics. Now remember, her father had a bird's eye view of the procedure because he's holding his daughter down for the operation. Mr. Trist stated that after Dr. Physics, quote, fixed the instrument, he took the thing off beautifully. The tonsil was about the size of the first joint of your thumb. I'm sure Patty did not feel it when it was coming off, end quote. So what about the bleeding? Mr. Trist commented that, quote, she bled about as much as the pulling of a tooth, but in time, not more than five minutes, her doctor physics made her haw and utter a sound, and there was not the least sign of blood, end quote. This was good. Now to be clear, only one of Patty's tonsils was removed. There is no record of any discussion surrounding that other tonsil at this time. Dr. Physics was satisfied with his one tonsil removal work, and he took his leave shortly after the operation. Later that night, Patty ate supper, apparently without much difficulty, according to her father. On Thursday morning, Dr. Physics returned to the boarding house to visit his patient. He was pleased enough. Apparently, Dr. Physics stated, quote, that Patty's throat was in as good a state as possible. Mr. Trist commented that Patty, quote, looks unusually well and pretty and is chattering like a magpie, end quote. Hmm. Those words were written by Mr. Trist on that very Thursday after the doctor's visit in a letter to his wife, his wife who's back in Washington, worrying, of course. Undoubtedly, Mr. Trist is trying to put a positive spin on it. I mean, the subtext of this letter is, quote, all is well, don't worry about our daughter, Patty is well, end quote. So in this letter, Mr. Trist shares his travel plans with his wife and he and Patty shall leave on Saturday, they'll head to Baltimore and then they'll arrive home. In early August, 1830, Mr. Trist followed up with Dr. Physics with a letter and payment. Sorry, I don't know what Dr. Physics charged for his services. But in this letter, August, 1830, Mr. Trist relayed the success of the one tonsil removal operation, but there still was the issue 
of a second apparently inflamed tonsil in Patty's throat. Interestingly, Dr. Physics is ambivalent about treatment. Did it warrant a surgical procedure or could a medical treatment do the job? It was suggested that perhaps the use of Aleppo galls as an astringent would work to reduce the inflammation and that might be enough to settle down that inflamed tonsil. But at best, this is what uh, Dr. Physics is writing. He says, quote, it's an uncertain remedy, end quote. And it doesn't work for the majority of cases. So if you find that that isn't working, Dr. Physics suggested that maybe it's best not to do this. And then you see Dr. Physics sway back to suggesting that tonsil surgery was the right course of action. Tonsil surgery, because as he stated, quote, the operation occasions so little suffering. Now, that's all I know about Patty's tonsils. I do not know if she ever had that other tonsil removed. I do know that Patty grew up and she married John Woolfolk Burke. Together they had seven children and Patty lived until she was 89 years old and she died in 1915. So what was the uptake of this method and use of the tonsil tone by physicians other than doctor physics? That's the broader question most medical historians would be interested in. It was a fun little case with, uh, with Patty Trist, but kind of what is the uptake or the acceptance of this new technology or device? And so as medical historians, we'll go back and look at the medical literature at the time, the debate among medical professionals, and basically what they're teaching the next generation of physicians coming through the pipe. So we look at contemporary surgical textbooks. And you see in this textbook by William Gibson, this is the first edition of the Institutes and Practice of Surgery, published in 1825, that in his section on the treatment of enlarged tonsils, Gibson describes how to remove tonsils with a knife and ligature. So this is 1825. And when Dr. Physics' work with the tonsil guillotine comes out three years later in 1828, lo and behold, the medical world took notice. So this is Gibson's third edition of his textbook, published in 1832. And there's quite a lot of space given over to Dr. Physics' new procedure and instrument, in addition to the knife and ligature text. So the tonsil guillotine approach did not replace or supplant that earlier information. It was simply added to the section. But Gibson really presents step-by-step -step instructions and illustrates the new instrument in this edition of his text. What Gibson has done is more or less cribbed Dr. Physics' publication on this matter, and Dr. Physics' procedure dominates the section on the treatment of enlarged tonsils, and the guillotine discussion is much lengthier than the other option of knife and ligature. This is a 19th century American surgical catalog. This is a George Teeman surgical instrument catalog published in 1879. Note the various tonsil instruments, including guillotines. There's various modified versions of Dr. Physics instrument. During the 1860s, Moral Mackenzie's modifications to the tonsil tone greatly added to the popularity of this instrument. More than three decades later, these are pages from the Nye Shear Company's instrument catalog, Nye Shear being another in American instrument maker. Note that there are triple the number of pages dedicated to tonsil tones by this time. And you can see the different mechanisms of the instrument. There are forks to pierce into the tonsil. There are different ring sizes. There are finger hooks if you didn't like the grip of a handle with your fist while you were operating. Here's another page from that same Nye Shear catalog. Uh, lots of options for different modified tonsil tones. But here's the thing. How do we know that physicians purchased these tonsil removing instruments? Which instruments did they prefer or which instruments were the top sellers? And did they use these instruments? So they just carry them around in the doctor's bags. I can tell you that all major instrument catalogs carried tonsil instruments and that over the decades, the range of different tonsil instruments offered increased and then decreased. So there's this waxing and waning of a number of instruments being uh, promoted out there. And it's following the medical debate uh, that's taking place in the literature surrounding best practices when it comes to tonsil excision. Uh, this, the debate that takes place in the medical literature, the journals first, and then makes its way in the textbooks. And I don't have time to go into that debate, but I'm happy to answer uh, the questions in the Q&A period about the medical voices out there that are arguing against using this instrument. And to bring it up to date, I found this uh, article, which I thought was interesting. Just when the tonsil guillotine had fallen out of favor by the late 19th, early 20th century, 
late 19th, early 20th century. It all of a sudden has an, another kind of resurgence in the late 20th century. And this article that the researchers are, you know, quite careful in their wording, but they suggest that in comparing the use of a tonsil guillotine, and in this case, a popper's hemostatic guillotine instrument with the traditional dissection by scissors and a blunt tonsil dissector uh, uh, procedure, that the results that are produced by the guillotine technique are superior. And they're suggesting that maybe there's a well-trained hands could find a place for this instrument back in the repertoire. So where does this all leave us? By way of conclusion and material for group discussion. I've highlighted two case studies or scenarios around cutting out hearts and tonsils. I'm situating them as arguably last resort options in the 20th and 19th centuries respectively. Where does this leave us when it comes to my research question about uh, surgical instruments and devices? Do they reinforce or do they disrupt the notion of surgery as a last resort treatment? I think it comes down to those three aspects of expectations, limitations, and uncertainty surrounding the specific surgery. The degree to which a particular operation is a last resort measure is linked to expectations of the surgeon and patient around a particular surgery limitations of the actual procedure as it pertains to the surgical equipment, the instruments, the devices, as well as the surgeon skills, uncertainty surrounding the procedure, that being the surgical risk, the surgical outcomes, so past outcomes as well as anticipated outcomes or how certain a success will be. I would argue that in the history of surgery, technology and instruments are part of this tension associated with an action an action of both a fix and a harm. That the surgical action is meant as a surgical fix, but it could potentially make us worse off. Thus cutting is associated with both fix and harm. And the technology and instruments exacerbate this tension associated with this action. So perhaps the real takeaway here can be reduced, be reduced to one word, ambiguity. The case studies and the last resort sentiment and implications are intertwined with this ambiguity of objects, how and why they're used, the outcomes associated with their use, and more. The ambiguity of objects, be they 20th century artificial hearts or 19th century tonsil guillotines, both are disruptive technologies in different ways that also reinforce a hesitancy when it comes to that big question, when to cut? or not to cut. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this topic, last resort sentiments and implications. Thank you. Well, thank you, Shelley. I'm gonna take the floor since um, I, and I'll open it up for questions in a minute, but I just had two interesting comments. First of all, I, I thought that was terrific and it really got the juices flowing, but I love the that, that, um, that triad of expectations, limitations, and uncertainty. I want to just give you a personal um, vignette. One of the things we see, I'm a primary care physician, I'm not a surgeon, is that we often are confronted with patients who come in specifically because they need preoperative approval for elective um, plastic surgery, sometimes by somebody we don't know. And um, it's just very interesting because it kind of shifts you know, and you can think about this as you work on your next book about the issue of um, the difference between expectations, limitations, and uncertainty between the doctor, between the patient, and uh, by the doctor, I mean the surgeon versus the primary care physician, who's often called to say, is this person safe to undergo surgery? So it's a, it's an interesting thing. And then the last thing is just the fact that with the whole rise of medical tourism, and, you know, people advertising for, you know, the orthopedic programs, bariatric surgery programs, just another um, thread to take in as you continue to think about surgery. Hmm. I was going to um, just leave that there and I was going to let some of the questions come through. What do you, what do you think to that? I agree this medical tourism and the idea of advertising strikes the Canadian so abruptly. And I remember being on a plane back when we were all traveling and opening up an American Airlines, you know, in the back of my seat and seeing an ad for, I think it was University of Texas, come here and we can do this for your, fix your heart. And in Canada, we don't, we, 
there's no advertising of drugs or procedures. And to see it advertised in a way in the United States struck a Canadian so strongly. And I think me medical tourism is that next level of this narrative out there of a, of, of a fix of a service with expectations of a successful outcome. Great, I'm gonna let um, Peggy take over. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That was super interesting. Um, I, I just I question the, um, that this is a last resort and that people don't want surgery. I actually think that a lot of people prefer surgery to drugs. Um, and you think, if you think about cancer, people want it, it out and they don't particularly understand why there has to be chemo. Why can't you just take the damn tumor out? Okay. Um, so I, I, I'm just kind of questioning, mm -hmm. um, you say that the, the, the reason we don't want or the reason the general public does not want surgery is visceral. And, you know, I don't, I don't feel that. Okay. Um, you know, when I remember uh, uh, when my father had a, a ruptured appendix and they told me that they were gonna treat it with antibiotics instead of surgery, I, I was not particularly happy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I learned I was wrong and they were right, but, but okay. You know, I just don't, I don't see it as a visceral no. Okay. So I, I was just curious to, to hear what you have to say about that. Whereas I think that a lot of people feel very viscerally against certain drugs, particularly um, chemotherapy drugs. True. And I guess as an historian looking after a longer kind of timeline, to what extent does the trauma or cutting into change the sense that it is traumatic or visceral or cutting or something that you choose not to pursue? Is it when we have pain management, when we have more successful outcomes, when the, the experience, when other options out there have less successful outcomes? So I guess I'm still, I'm stu still teasing out this success failure tension. And of course, in medicine, nothing can be guaranteed. So what why is there always need to be this discussion, this preamble before going into the OR of looking at the, looking at the possibilities of things that could go wrong? Though arguably you could say with the drug, kind of the new post 1950s explosion in pharmacological options that you do the same thing. It's called side effects. You know, you may experience all these side effects, right? So the, every option has its side effects. And to what extent does certain group of people understand those side effects as being acceptable or not? And is then is it a loaded term in terms of depends on the procedure? So like when your father had his procedure, that was an immediate reaction, just take out the, the organ that's ruptured, because that makes sense to me to remove the offense, right? And it's localized versus something that perhaps isn't localized. It doesn't serve itself well. So maybe, maybe I'm being too uh ambitious and thinking that it's too big a topic that i have to narrow it down to specifics to be able to make any kind of assessment of these terms i mean or i think there, at all. There, there i just think there's a common feeling of get the damn thing out hmm. when, when that's a when that's the problem surgery looks really good and people okay, so feel here's that question, here's a question for you, that, Peggy. let me throw this back then just get the damn thing out. I want to get it done because next week I want to be back on the golf course. Is this more common about culture's immediate reaction? And I only say that because my husband's a physiotherapist. So people want to come in, lay your hands on me, attach me this modality and make me better as opposed to giving me an exercise regimen, go away for two weeks and do these exercises and then come back and we'll see where we're at. But there's an immediacy. People want an immediate fix. No, I, I mean, I, I, I get the idea of, of physical therapy over, over surgery, but um, in the case of, you know, in the case of a, a, a severe dysplasia in, in cells, I mean, why, why do we want that? We don't want that. Take it out. That makes me super happy. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just don't, I don't have the visceral thing. I, I'm also... You know, I'm a scientist, so I don't have a gross out factor, but um, I just don't have that visceral thing that you talked about. So I'm just really curious why you're drawing that line. I, I don't see the line. And it could be, it could I, be I see a, it more. I see it more. It could, be an, 
it could be an age or a generation thing because we all remember, you know, Dances with Wolves, Kevin Costner at the beginning, the amputation of the leg, how visceral and bloody and whatnot. And I mentioned that to my med students and they go, who's Kevin Costner? You know, and I go, Yellowstone. Okay, that guy. Okay, got it. You know, so this idea of what surgery looks like, the, the 19th century or, you know, the Nick, right? And kind of looking at shows that show how visceral it is when the first, um, if you've seen the episode of the Nick where they do the cesarean section, right? And, and, and how visceral that is of slicing up the abdomen to grab the baby out, right? Maybe, maybe it's more of a, a 19th, 20th, 21st century. I have to, I have to segment, seg, segment it more by times, this visceral action. Is it cultural phenomenon? And even dissected even further, no pun intended, by different cultures in North American, European, African, whatever. Megan, is, is that okay, Peggy? Yeah. Megan, you want to take the floor and keep the conversation going? Well, thank you, Peggy. I'm yeah. going to like that word visceral and saying rethink that term. Maybe that's not the right point uh, descriptor. Thank you. But I think I do. So I am a surgeon. Um, and I do think um, the temporal nature has to be considered, right? Like surgery now is very different than it was 20 years ago, 50 years ago. So the concept that it was a last resort I think is different because surgery now is so much safer and what we can do is so much more broad. And I think that goes into part of the, the conversation, you know, having your appendix out today versus 50 years ago is a completely different beast. And so you have to sort of I think you have to consider that um, with it. I do agree with Peggy. I think there's a certain notion of, yes, you just want it, you know, gone and done and, you know, take care of it yesterday. Um, and sometimes I think we as surgeons have to be kind of careful with that. I, I was taught, and I think this is very true, that it's much harder not to operate than it is to operate. And sometimes making the decision to, you say, sit on your hands um, is really difficult, especially if you have a patient who is absolutely convinced that that's what they need. It can be a really difficult um, position to be in. So that big question of to cut or not to cut. Is that, is that a reflection of your training, as you said, about the, the better outcome for this patient is not to cut? Or is this about shared decision-making? It's a patient's choice. Yeah, it's really, it's really complicated because yes, the patients do have some choice, but they also come at it from a different perspective and a different um, training, right? Like I have training as a surgeon. They usually don't have training as a surgeon. So at what point does my training as a surgeon get, when should that have more credibility than what they want? I would argue most of the time, if you have two equal things, then that's a different story, but that's, that's a very rare situation. Um, but you know, I, sh I should be able to make the decision. Um, and you know, there have been times when I don't know what the right answer is. And I just say, you know, we both have to be kind of uncomfortable with this and I don't know what's going to happen, but as long as we talk about it, we talk about what the options are then theoretically, no one can really be upset afterwards. Now that's not really true, but, mm -hmm. but, you know, you just have to be really clear in those situations where you don't know what the best solution is. Can I put you on the spot, Dr. Arnold, and ask you that <laughs> on that slide that I showed you those 21st advertisements, which I just took off the internet, they're all about surgery right. and they all use the words last resort. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, there's so many reasons why I want to move to Canada, but uh, <laughs> that's one of them. Um, um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's, I think we do it. I, I think it's sort of unconscionable how we advertise surgery, drugs, ev everything medical, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it, it also gives, I think, a false sense of expectation that you can just go anywhere and ask for what you want um, mm -hmm. based on nothing. And you know, advertisements, you know, drug advertisements are written by the drug companies. There's a reason they're doing it. And there's a reason they pay millions of dollars to do this because it works. You know, we all physicians say, oh no, it doesn't influence our prescribing. Well, there's a reason why drug reps aren't allowed in hospitals anymore um, because it does affect whether you believe it or not, it does affect your decision-making. Mm -hmm. um, so no, I, I think it's, I think it's a, it's a, horrible, horrible idea, but I'm also a pediatric surgeon. So I'm a little bit protected from, um, a lot of that. Um, so yeah, you're probably dealing with the issue of fear and, and just oh, all the time. Large, more than a person making a decision on their own bodies, right? It's for my child's yeah. body to go forward. Yeah. 
Yeah, that can be hard when you have a kid that's like screaming at you, don't touch me. And you sort of have to hold them down and do things. I, I describe it to my trainees. It's like an out of body experience. You just sort of have to focus on what you have to get done and just get it done quickly and, you know, do the best that you can for pain control and distraction and, and those sorts of things. But yeah, that it, that's certainly a little bit more unique to pediatric surgery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Carolyn, you're on deck. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for this talk. Um, I also had a question about shared decision making, and it's not a fully formed question, so feel free to redirect it if it if it isn't of interest to you. But I was thinking about the implications of your talk for sort of advising patients who may see a surgery as last resort when the physician doesn't see it as last resort. That kind of tension um, seems to arise fairly commonly. So. Um, so I was really thinking about like, well, when do you talk about the instruments? Like wh when would it be maybe be useful to talk about the instruments of surgery in order to kind of counsel a patient through this um, uh, idea of the last resort, the kind of dominating idea of the last resort. And then it, it made me think that maybe there's a real like distinction that needs to be made between the kind of instrument that you're talking about in the heart uh, case, um, uh, the mechanical heart case versus the kind of instrument that you're talking about in the tonsil case. I mean, the sort of actual cutting instrument. And um, so anyway, I, there's a lot there, but I wondered if you had thought a bit about um, the, the sort of implications of your talk on that. This That's is a your great question. You, you caught me out. You caught me out because you're right. The two instruments, there's a lot of disconnect because one's a therapeutic, it's a device to save a life. And the other one's a tool to perform the surgery. So they're it's it's more than apples and oranges it's apples and you know um kumquat or something or <laughs> squash or something right so they are different but it's interesting because i work with medical objects and we look at kind of the life of objects or how they're used by physicians and surgeons and for lots of uh decades or many decades a lot of the surgeons and physicians the tools were their badge right it's like what dr arnold is saying with authority and credentialing and power and i will make decisions look at in my bag i've got all the tricks of the trade and and, it, and i'm empowered to use them in a successful way and you don't have these instruments and the instruments themselves within the degree, not only do you, you know, I don't have the kind of the low end tonsil tone, I have the best tonsil tone. It's made by French designers, right? You know, there's this whole kind of leveling of showing your authority and power and, and legitimacy by the, the tools that you have. And I think with the artificial heart device, I mean, and I show that busy slide just to show you that it's part of this, this, this kind of staging of preparing patients for where they're at and what options are out there. And I think the tension is, like you said, when you have these discussions, whether it be palliative care, or we're not really there yet, or when do we exhaust the drugs and move to devices? And, and the idea that could we go back and forth? Usually you're pretty committed with an LVAD, right? And kind of the whole shift. And, and from what I understood when researching the book is each center basically has their favored device. Not that the, you know, the one LVAD works better than another bell, or, you know, the heart mage or the HVAD, it's what you've been trained on, what you've practiced on, and you have your success rate. So again, it's muddled with the device is only one part of the puzzle to contribute to. I still think it's about your successful outcomes. And I think what Dr. Arnold, I think, alluded to is this doctor-patient relationship shift that's happening in that. Whereas my grandmother would go and say, be very quiet and say, whatever you think, doctor, I will just do. Now it's a discussion, a debate. You go away and you research. You know, we talk with our medical students about Dr. Google. How do you have that conversation where they have lots of information? You kind of co-op them and say, let's share this information, right? And the idea that I think, again, it's a service industry in many ways, and in your context, consumerism in a way that we don't have the same level in Canada. And I think this discussion, this debate is, you know, I think it's so tricky to have, and it's relationships that you're building for this trust and moving forward with patient care. But thank you, that, that was a great question in terms of tools and what they contribute. So, thanks, so Peggy, do you wanna wade in there? Yeah, I'm just curious about, you mentioned about, um, is there a choice yeah. when, when the problem is, is, um, is desperate? And, mm -hmm. and I didn't really get your answer to that. I mean, is there any, is there an argument to make, to be made for there being choice? I can easily see the argument that there is no choice there, that it's not a free and, free and open choice, but 
Is there an argument to be made that there is a choice being a free choice being um, offered? Well, and certainly in the artificial hearts case, this whole idea that a dying person cannot give informed consent, right? That, that there's somehow that relationship and making clear head kind of decisions is suspect, right? And so what at what point, and this is what a lot of people are arguing to introduce the technology at an earlier point before the, the, uh, the, the idea of options has been eliminated completely. And I think when it comes to terms to doing surgeries and especially when it comes to pediatric cases, you know, Nicholas Trist had decided his daughter was having this tonsil removed by hell or high water, right? And whether she had laudanum or not, and holding her down, I, I mean, you know, you could see how that would happen quite quickly, uh, kind of the idea of choice, who has the choice and who, who has preconceived ideas. It's almost at this point, Nicholas Trist has made the decision to travel all the way from uh, Washington to Philadelphia for this service and, he, and physics is gonna give it to him. So I'm not even sure the choice it's preconceived. It's a service. I, I asked. I asked my mom whether she um, gave informed consent before she gets anti-VEGF into her eye for macular degeneration, and and she says, "Well, I, I take. I have to call an Uber to go there, so it it means nothing to sign a paper. It means something to call the Uber and to get up and make sure somebody is taking care of my dog." And well, and yeah, it's like my grandparents, informed consent, I, you know, I gave that by the fact of making an appointment with my doctor, full stop. Shelly, later when you have the discussion with the fellows and you talk to some of the surgeons, one of the things I am intrigued by is um, surgical tools and the competence and that whole area, for instance, you know, here we do things with this Da Vinci robot, you know, mm -hmm. huge high tech thing, but I was most struck when I went to the special collections and uh, saw the bone saw mm -hmm. and actually held it. And I thought to myself, you were talking about the instrument makers and the cutlers is that the ability to really have an instrument that makes you feel like you can do things. And I brought a couple of orthopedic surgeons and I know they had the experience of seeing some of these older tools and feeling like, oh yeah, that's one of my favorite instruments, or I really like this or the mm -hmm. fact these things used to be personally made and mm -hmm. could be decorated. You know, now everything's thrown into like the autoclave. But at one time, you know, they had, you know, either ivory or mother of pearl or these things. They were like just not just a mark of pride, but customized. So later when you have the discussion with the fellows, because I think there's a lot to this thing. And I think the, on one hand, so surgery is a continuum, right? You know, people think about doing these things, you know, you know, so they think that there are things we do every day all the time, right? You go to a dermatologist, they mm -hmm. biopsy just in the office. I don't even think they ask for consent. They just make a little mm -hmm. hole in their arm all the way to, you know, cataract surgery, which is done so routinely that people, you mm -hmm. know, bat an eye, sorry for the pun, to <laughs> surgery, which people feel like is life transforming to, you know, the heart surgery. But I think this concept of expectation, limitations, and uncertainty is a great one to think about surgery because there's, you know, the patient, the doctor, and then it may be not just the doctor, but the people who are intermediate between the patient and the surgeon. So I thought that was superb. Yeah, I, I think the number of stakeholders involved are, is a uh, much larger number than we give it credit for. And again, I'll go back to Dr. Arnold's comment about power and about doesn't necessarily mean if we've got five or six or eight stakeholders of it, they all have equal power. That the surgeon's voice should trump probably the sales rep consumer, you know, that's pushing, right? So, and, and I think that's one thing to understand about decision making that doesn't mean that everyone has the same slice of pie. So I'm going to just open it up for last questions before we give Shelly a little time to just get a drink, take a rest, and then uh, reconnect at 1.30 with the fellows. But on behalf of the McLean Center, Mark Siegler, Elena, and I, I just want to thank you for an outstanding talk and something that was very uh, provocative and intellectually stimulating. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you.